right, Paul, thank you. And welcome everybody to this episode of Breaking the Chain, your post maintenance checklist. Here's our agenda tonight. What the WINGS program is, we'll talk about uh, who all is gonna be participating in bringing this webinar to you tonight. Um, we'll cover what the break in the chain program is and what we're trying to accomplish for those who have uh, not participated in this program before. And uh, we'll have our presenter tonight and then we'll have an open forum with question and answers. Uh, tonight we will uh, do our question and answer session via the chat. Uh, and uh, between myself and Paul, we will present the questions to Mr. Bush and allow him to elaborate and answer. Then we'll have our closing comments, talk about uh, the next event coming up on August the 25th. And uh, I will give you a passcode at the end of the presentation so that I can grant everyone who participates tonight a uh, WINGS credit. This is a FAA safety team meeting. And uh, my program manager is Mr. Ryan Newman. He's uh, at San Antonio FISDO. And if any of you guys have any questions about the uh, Fast Team program, WINGS program, or you want to comment about the webinar tonight, uh, send Mr. Newman a email at this uh, email address right here. I spoke a little bit about WINGS credit. What is WINGS credit? WINGS credit is an opportunity to log in, create a profile, and get notified of aviation safety webinars and seminars throughout uh, your assigned location. And you can acquire WINGS credit and build up to a certain WINGS level and get uh, insurance discounts. It can count towards a flight review. And I will go as far to say that the real advantage to the WINGS program more than anything is to be a part of a group of pilots <laughs> who want to further aviation <clears throat> safety um, and learn a great deal of wealth of knowledge from uh, subject matter expertise across the board. So check out that URL, faasafety.gov, go in, create a WINGS profile and become a WINGS participant. Uh, my name is Jeremy Walters. I'm a professional pilot, ATP airplane working on the ATP helicopter. Uh, I'm a professional flight instructor. That's what I really love to do more than anything. I love to inspire. I love to teach. I love to mentor and I love to promote safety in this uh, uh, world of aviation that we live in, this glorious time in humanity. Um, I'm a uh, major in the United States Army Reserves. And as a matter of fact, as we sit right now, I'm on active duty orders going through a course called Command and General Staff College, which is a requirement to promote to Lieutenant Colonel in a couple of years. I am a, a lead FAST team representative within the San Antonio FISDO area. And uh, this presentation will be recorded and uploaded to the All American Aviation YouTube channel. And on that channel, I uh, promote aviation safety, education, and, and adventure. So take a moment, go uh, look at my channel, and give me a look and subscribe if you feel up to it. So I couldn't do this without assistance from a techno uh, guru like uh, Mr. Paul. Uh, Paul Nadal is uh, assisting me tonight. Uh, he works for VMware. He's also also a very passionate uh, aviator. He's an instrument rated private pilot and uh, he participates in angel flights. Uh, I didn't put it on a slide, but he's also a United States Navy veteran, uh, Desert Storm vet. So what is breaking the chain? Well, there's a program that I began um, throughout my local area with a friend of mine uh, about three years ago <laughs> over a discussion at Cooper's Barbecue in Lano, Texas. Uh, between uh, the receipt of a mission to go fly and an accident, there is a 
series of events that lead from a rec receipt of the mission to the accident. There is a link for every error made on the way to that accident. And the theory is that if we can break one of the links of the chain, we can prevent the accident from happening. So as illustrated here, our mission and end state break the chain. We start out, we jump in the airplane, we go fly. And as I mentioned, the uh, beginning of the mission is where uh, the first link starts. We get to a situation where we have an incident or an accident. And as you can see, our goal is to snap one of those links in the chain. And if we can do that, then perhaps we can prevent an accident from happening. How do we execute? By doing exactly what we're doing right now. Pilots taking care of pilots, getting together and chatting. We do it by researching, planning, training, 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 being self-aware of human factor flaws, being self-aware of our own human factor flaws, and thinking like a professional aviator. I put a big star by that because I don't care whether you fly uh, a Piper Cub occasionally on the weekends as a sport, uh, as a recreational pilot, or whether you fly a 747 from Houston to uh, Munich. A professional pilot is a professional pilot. A professional pilot does the right thing when no one is watching. And sometimes that's um, speaking up when you need to speak. Sometimes it's um, looking into things that you may not know, no matter how much flight time and experience you have. And one thing I will elaborate on here is training never stops. Training never stops from day zero to the day that you quit flying. And that's what it's like to think as a professional aviator. Then we wanna maintain that breaking the chain mindset. What is maintaining the breaking the chain mindset? That, in, that it means having the foresight to look forward, identify uh, risk, mitigate the risk, and prevent something from happening or having at least a way out. Mitigating uh, a risk so that you can have a safe outcome. Overall, what we're trying to accomplish here is foster a safety conscious atmosphere. And with that being said, tonight we will present our guest speaker, Mr. Mike Bush, who is the best known AMPIA in general aviation. He writes the monthly savvy maintenance column in AOPA Pilot and hosts free monthly EAA sponsored maintenance webinars. Mike is a graduate of Dartmouth College with a bachelor's in mathematics. He did graduate work in mathematics at Princeton University and business administration at Columbia University. And he is retired after a long and successful career as a pioneering software entrepreneur. Mike co-founded AvLab in 1995 and served as its editor in chief and investigative journalist. Mike has helped thousands of aircraft owners resolve thorny maintenance problems that have stumped their local AMPs for years. In 2008, Mike founded Savvy Aviation, which provides maintenance-related services to owners of Piston GA airplanes. Those services include maintenance management and consulting, engine monitoring data analysis, a nationwide free buy management program, and a 24-7 breakdown assistance that is essentially AAA for general aviation. He's a flight instructor, prolific aviation writer, teacher, and speaker, and focuses primarily on general aviation. And now I have the distinct honor to present to you all tonight, a guest speaker, Mr. Mike Bush. Mike, you have the flight controls. Okay, well, good evening, everybody. Let me try to share my screen here. And, uh, 
I'm going to turn off my camera just to minimize the bandwidth here. Uh, and thank you very much for inviting me to, uh, to this uh, fast team uh, safety session. Uh, we're going to be uh, uh, talking about a post maintenance checklist. That's uh, really a pre flight checklist for uh, the, the first flight or the first couple of flights after the aircraft uh, comes out of maintenance. Um, my, the, the way this, uh, this thing started is uh, my, my company, Savvy Aviation, employs 17 A&P mechanics, 14 of whom are very, very veteran IAs. We manage the maintenance of around 1,000 GA aircraft. We do analytical services and breakdown assistance for probably 10,000 more. Um, and one day, one of our clients uh, who had just wrapped up an annual inspection on his aircraft um, asked uh, one of our uh, IA account managers, what should I look for on a pre-flight after an annual inspection? Um, good question. The IA posed this question to our group and uh, needless to say, a vigorous uh, discussion ensued. I took really good notes <laughs> and uh, got a lot of good ideas to, to uh, as the answer to that. Um, Many owners assume that when an aircraft uh, comes out of maintenance, particularly when it comes out of something like an annual inspection, it's been thoroughly scrutinized by well-trained eyes and can be depended upon to be safe to fly. Mechanics know better than that. Uh, in fact, of the matter is the first flight after maintenance is by far the most likely time for something to go wrong with the hardware. Um, I mean, after all, it's, uh, it's, it's just been partially disassembled maybe extensively disassembled, depending on what work was done uh, uh, during the uh, annual inspection. It's been inspected then, and then reassembled. And uh, while the inspection is intended to in uh, uncover discrepancy, it's the reassembly process that is most vulnerable to, uh, to human error. Um, anytime you take something apart and put it back together, there's a chance that you're not gonna put it back together right. And, um, it happens to, to all of us. I've seen some of the most seasoned mechanics, the people who are my heroes in the maintenance industry, uh, make mistakes uh, when putting aircraft back together. Um, and we call these, these things, uh, when they, they cause a problem, we call them maintenance-induced failures. Um, and a lot of the, uh, the, the problems that happen after maintenance, probably the lion's share of them, are errors of omission. Uh, that were, were something, uh, a mechanic took something apart and in putting it back together, uh, forgot to do something, got interrupted, uh, went out of the lunch break, got a phone call. There, there's just a million distractions that can happen when an airplane goes back together that can result uh, in a maintenance-induced failure. So I uh, tried to put together a list of, of things that we want to do on the, the first flight after maintenance. Um, and some of them are things that we should do on every flight, and some of them are things that we're going above and beyond what you would typically do uh, in an average uh, on an average flight. Um, and we start by by uh, by looking for the for the obvious stuff. Um, uh, the, the the most common problem that we see after uh, uh, after inspection is that that stuff got left off. Uh, inspection plates are either missing or hanging by one screw. And if you go flying that way, the inspection plate will wind up coming back bent at a, at a, at a 135 degree angle. Um, inspection panels, fairings, uh, all sorts of attached screws. Uh, uh, I know we work on a lot of Cirrus aircraft that have some screws up in the, the very front of the nose bowl right behind the prop that are very easy to forget. Um, cowling fasteners latched, uh, uh, nose bowl and spinner screws. Uh, so uh, anytime maintenance is done and the airplane's been decowled and, and inspection plates have been taken off, th there's a really good chance that, that some of them haven't been put on correctly or were forgotten. So the pre-flight really needs to take a very, very cl close look at this. And you probably want to go around more than, more than once just looking for that sort of stuff. Um, 
uh, flight and engine controls uh, free and correct. Um, they want to make sure that all of the controls can can operate throughout their, their full range. Um, if there was any engine work done, uh, you want to make sure uh, you know the throttle and mixture control and prop control um, are, can, will move freely through their, their full range. You don't want to find that stuff out in the air. Um, seats checked for security. Uh, the seats typically come out of the airplane uh, during an inspection and when they get put back together it's possible that something got forgotten. Sometimes the seats aren't placed on the seat rails quite right. Sometimes uh, the, the safety stops that prevent the seats from running off the end of the rails are, are, are forgotten and left off. Um, one of the things we see a lot when aircrafts are decaled and then recaled are that the flexible baffle seals, those, those rubber strips that, uh, that, that seal the engine cooling baffles against the cowling um, are, are sometimes, uh, when the cowl goes on, those, those baffle seals aren't oriented correctly. Um, in the typical aircraft where in flight, there's a high pressure area above the engine and a low pressure area below the engine, and that's what uh, provides the cooling over the cylinders. It's really important that all of those flexible baffle seals be oriented upward or forward so that when the upper cowling pressurizes in flight, those seals are pressed tight against the cowling. If they're oriented backwards, if they're oriented downwards or backwards, then when the cowling pressurizes in flight, they'll just, they'll just blow away from the, from the cowling and let lots of cooling air escape and, and let the engine overheat. So you just want to look into the cooling inlets with a flashlight. Um, if you've got uh, an airplane like a Bonanza that has big cowling doors, you want to open those up and look very carefully about how all those baffles are oriented. Um, obviously you want to check the fuel level, uh, check the oil level. A real good friend of mine who's a very well-known uh, pilot, I'm not going to mention his name, uh, he's, he's an ATP, he flies airliners, he, he, he just uh, put a new engine in his Bonanza and uh, uh, the engine was uh, was was run up uh, at the at the engine shop on a test stand and so on and then he spent weeks installing it in the airplane and getting everything just perfect. Took the airplane out uh, for the first uh, test flight. Um, there was no oil in the engine. He, he basically trashed trashed the engine and it had to go back to the engine shop. He assumed that the engine was going to come from the engine shop with oil in it because it had run on the test stand, but the shop emptied the oil out of the engine for shipping and he never checked that it was in. So anytime the airplane's in maintenance, it's got had an oil change, you want to make sure that the, that the, that the oil level is appropriate. Um, drain all the, the, the sumps. That's something you would normally do, but again, after maintenance, there's a higher than average chance that there's going to be contamination in the fuel system, particularly if the fuel system got opened up for some reason in the course of maintenance. Um, do another walk around looking for signs of uh, hangar rash, anything else that doesn't look right. It's, it's probably worth going around the airplane three or four times uh, on the first uh, uh, pre-flight after maintenance. Um, verify security of uh, of fuel and oil caps. I don't know how many times people have, have taken off and, and uh, an oil cap is not secure and it can make quite a mess when you do that. That happened to me once many, many, many years ago. I was flying a rental airplane out of Key West and, uh, and uh, the oil cap was left loose and I missed it and uh, made a heck of a mess. And so I, that, that, that was a, a big lesson learned for me. Um, so anything that, that needs to be closed and latched, uh, uh, baggage doors, uh, my, my 310 has a big door up in the nose that if it opens in flight, it uh, gets pretty dicey. So I want to make sure all, everything that needs to be closed is closed. So after we've walked around the airplane three or four times looking for just about anything that could have possibly been forgotten, it's time to start the engine. Um, Again, some of this stuff is stuff that you would do on every flight, um, but you want to be extra, extra careful and uh, probably do more on the first flight out of maintenance than you normally would. 
all electrical switches off because you were not the last one to manipulate the switches in the airplane like you usually were and you don't know what state they're left in. All pullable circuit breakers uh, pressed in frequently during maintenance, breakers are pulled and the mechanic may not have put them back in. So you need to go check that. Battery master switch on, check the bus voltage. Um, every airplane really ought to have a voltmeter. Um, uh, some have one that was installed at the factory. Some of you have digital engine monitors that can read out bus voltage. If you don't have a voltmeter in the airplane, it's very useful to put one in and you can buy an inexpensive one that goes into a cigarette lighter socket, but some way of being able to read bus voltage. And when you turn the, 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 the battery switch on, which may be a separate switch, maybe a, a split master switch with a battery on one side and an alternator switch on the other side, but when you turn it on, you should see battery voltage, which typically is either 12 volts or 24 volts. Um, the uh, battery ammeter, which is normally on the panel, should show a small discharge um, at once you've turned the, uh, uh, tur turned the, uh, the battery switch on. And then start the engine. Verify oil pressure comes up promptly. I wrote a article in AOPA pilot a couple months ago about a, a Cessna 421 crash that, that, that killed the pilot um, that was caused by a mechanic doing a run-up uh, and uh, not getting oil pressure and not noticing it until significant damage had been done to the rear main bearings of the engine uh, and ultimately that came apart and killed the pilot. Um, so when you start the engine after maintenance, your eyes want to be right on the oil pressure gauge and you want to make sure that the oil pressure comes up within 10 or 15 seconds. If it doesn't, shut down the engine and figure out what's, what's going on. Verify that the engine uh, idles smoothly at minimum RPM um, and then turn on the alternator. When you turn on the alternator, again, check the voltmeter. It should have come up now to alternator voltage, which is typically around 14 or 28. So with the alternator off, it should be 12 or 24. With the alternator on, it should be 14 or 28 for most of our aircraft. And the ammeter should show a small to moderate charge at this point because the battery has been discharging a little bit before we turn on the alternator and now it should, should be charging uh, back up. Um, once you're sure that the bus voltage is okay, um, you can turn the avionics master switch on, verify that everything lights up. Some of the radios may have been turned off in maintenance, uh, so don't take that, you know, take anything for granted. Make sure that everything lights up. And most importantly, that nothing smells wrong. If something smells like an electrical smell or anything that's burning, you, you wanna shut the, uh, the, the uh, electrics down right away and then investigate. If you have uh, an engine monitor installed, which hopefully most of you do, you wanna verify uh, that all the cylinders are combusting by the, and are making EGT. Um, if, uh, if, if, a, if you find that one of the cylinders is, is not making EGT, um, and the engine will probably be running rough, we call that condition morning sickness, and it's indicative of a, of a, uh, of a sticking valve and it's something that needs to be taken care of um, before it gets bad enough that it can actually do damage to the engine by bending a push rod or, or something like that. Um, so morning sickness check. Well, well, as soon as the engine monitor goes online, make sure that all the cylinders are, 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 are making uh, reasonable EGT, that they're all combusting. Let the engine idle um, until you see the oil temperature and CHT start to come up. Uh, this time of year, it shouldn't take very long. Uh, during the winter, it might take a little longer. And then lean the mixture to, uh, uh, to at least best power mixture, which be, would be maximum RPM. Um, I like to actually lean the mixture even a little bit more brutally than that during ground operations. But I see a lot of pilots who um, taxi around with the mixture control full rich. Uh, that's probably something they got from their primary training where their flight instructor was basically saying, don't worry about the red knob. <laughs> uh, we've got other things to worry about. 
but it's very, very bad for, uh, for the engine to run full rich on the ground, except when, it's, when you're first starting it cold. It's an exceedingly rich mixture and, and uh, creates all sorts of deposits and, and, and can lead to things like valve sticking and so on. So uh, once the engine starts to warm up, you want to lean it pretty aggressively, at least to maximum RPM and maybe even a little leaner than that, uh, depending on your, your preference. So now we've got an engine. It's moderately warm. It's lean for taxi. And uh, now we can taxi out to the run-up area. While taxiing out, there are a bunch of things you can check while you're taxiing. Um, uh, I like to tap each of the brakes and verify that each of the brakes is, is working and that, uh, uh, that the brake pedals feel okay. They don't feel spongy and they don't, you know, go, go uh, they, they don't get depressed too far before you start feeling braking action. You want to make sure that there's adequate brake fluid in the system and that there aren't a lot of air bubbles in, in trapped in the brake fluid. So you can check that as during your taxi out. Um, I like to make some shallow S turns on the taxiway as I'm taxiing out to do two things. First of all, to verify that the nose wheel steering is um, is working properly, or conceivably tail wheel steering if you have a tail wheel airplane, and also to verify that the uh, that the turn indicator, whether it's a turn and bank or or a turn coordinator, uh, but the turn uh, ready turn gyro is deflecting uh, as you make shallow S turns. Um, check that the, that the attitude indicator gyro has erected properly um, and uh, check the, uh, the DG or HSI for proper heading. If it's a DG, you'll want to set it. If it's an HSI, you'll want to make sure that it's slaved correctly to, a, to the heading of the taxiway that you're taxiing on. But this is all stuff you can do while you're taxiing out to the run-up area. No reason to waste that time. Once you're in the run-up area, we want to do an extra, uh, extra thorough run-up. Um, again, verify that the brakes hold uh, and, and feel uh, firm and, and, and good because you're going to be applying some power and you don't want the airplane to creep. We want to do a mag check um, and make sure that the engine runs smoothly on each mag individually. If you have an engine monitor, um, I tend to focus more on what the EGTs do than on the tachometer. The, the old way of doing a mag check where we're looking for RPM drop was fine back in the old days when we had very primitive engine instrumentation. But if you have a, an engine monitor, um, what I do during the mag check is, is watch the EGTs, make sure that they all rise when you go to single mag operation and that none of them fall. Make sure that the engine is running smoothly on uh, each mag individually. And unlike most POHs, I recommend doing the mag check um, with the engine leaned. Uh, we've leaned it for taxi. I would, I would keep it right there for the, for the run up. And the reason that I recommend doing the mag check lean is because it's harder for a spark plug to ignite a lean mixture than a rich mixture. So the leaner the mixture is, uh, the more discriminating that mag check will be and, and, and the, 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 the better it will do at checking marginal ignition system performance. Um, well, an ignition system can be in pretty sorrow shape and still uh, ign ignite a full rich mixture. So we want to make it a little harder for the spark plug to ignite the mixture during the mag check so that we're, we're, we're stressing out the ignition, ignition system a little bit more on the test is more discriminating of problems. Um, if you have a controllable pitch prop, you'll want to cycle the prop. I see a lot of pilots who were taught to always cycle the prop deeply three times. I don't know why people cycle the prop three times, but there's no reason to do that. If you pull out the prop control and you get a prompt response, that's all you have to do. You don't have to do it two or three more times. Um, what are we trying to do when we cycle a prop? Two things. First of all, make sure that the prop control actually works, that, the, that, that you can control the pitch of the prop. And the second is to get some warm oil in the hub. And uh, cycling the prop once uh, will do that if, if, if it responds promptly um, once is enough. And, and cycling the prop is a little bit hard on, on the engine. So you really don't want to do it any more often than you have to. Um, 
check all flight instruments are, are normal, electrical instruments are, are, are normal, everything in the green. Um, we want to make sure that we aren't taking any problems into the air. Again, before takeoff, we once again want to check all flight controls are free and correct. You need to just move the flight controls through all four corners of the box, if you will. It's it, it's it's obvious box if it's if it's a stick control. If it's a yoke, it's kind of the same thing. You turn it all the way in one direction, you pull it all the way out, turn it all the way in the other direction, push it all the way in, and you've exercised those flight controls through all of the extremes. Um, cycle of flaps throughout the range, uh, particularly if they're electric flaps, to make sure that the mechanism is is working correctly and that the micro switches and everything that are involved in positioning the flaps are working correctly. Uh, check all trim control. I, I like to rotate the trim wheels all the way to the stop in one direction, then all the way to the stop in the other direction. Make sure that it moves smoothly all the way and then return it to an appropriate setting somewhere in the middle after you've checked it um, uh, for, uh, for, for travel throughout its range and then set the, the flaps and trim for takeoff. Now it's time to, uh, to go flying. The first flight out of maintenance needs to be treated as a test flight. If, if, if something's gonna go wrong with the airplane, this is the flight when it's gonna happen. So we wanna do it in the vicinity of the airport so that if something goes wrong, you can put the airplane back on the ground quickly. You wanna do it in day VFR with no passengers except maybe your a and <laughs> I often joke that if I ever uh, was a FAA administrator for a day, which is not very likely to happen, the, the, the first change I would make to the regulations is to require mechanics to go up on the first flight after any annual that they sign off. <laughs> but I don't think that's likely to happen. And a lot of mechanics don't like to go up on test flights. Um, most important, you want to make this flight with a test pilot's mindset. Um, that is, um, you, you want to tell yourself before takeoff that this is the flight where something's going to go wrong. Prepare yourself for something to go wrong. Expect something to go wrong. Um, if we're talking about a, a piston aircraft, which mostly we are here, be spring-loaded to abort the takeoff. If anything looks, sounds, feels, or smells wrong during the takeoff roll, we do not want to ever take a problem into the air. So uh, if, if you were ever going to reject a takeoff, this is the time to do it. If you're flying a jet, it's a different story. Reject the takeoffs can be pretty dangerous in jets and frequently uh, the best thing to do is to take it into the air and come around and land. But in a piston aircraft, we don't ever want to take a problem into the air. So um, think about the, that first takeoff after maintenance as being one that you're likely to reject. If anything doesn't seem right, you, you, you want to abort the takeoff, get off the runway, and then sort things off, so, sort things out, figure out what was wrong, and, and then maybe taxi back and, and try the takeoff again. Um, so if if something significant was done to the airplane, an annual inspection, a cylinder change, any sort of invasive maintenance of the aircraft, um, we don't want to trust the aircraft. We want to make a, a couple of circuits around, around the airport before we venture off any distance away um, because we, we want to be able to beat a hasty retreat, get things back down on the ground quickly if anything goes wrong. Um, then you should have a, a list of things that you want to check on the test flight. Um, here are some things that you might want to test during that, during that first test flight. Oil pressure, cylinder head temperature, if it's a turbocharged engine, turbine inlet temperature, uh, electrical uh, parameters, uh, amps and volts. Um, does the airplane fly straight, hands off the controls? Is, is, it, uh, is it rigged correctly? Do all the avionics work, particularly the, the autopilot? Um, here's something that's really important, and this drives me absolutely nuts uh, with some of our clients. On the first flight after maintenance, if you encounter any sort of an anomaly, don't fly home that way. 
turn around and take the airplane back to the shop and let the mechanic correct the problem. A uh, few things frustrate maintenance people more than a, an owner that picks up an airplane after maintenance, flies home to some other airport, and then calls and says something's wrong with the airplane. You, you want to take it back to the shop. Um, and while we're talking about taking it back to the shop, I'd like to talk a little bit about the timing of when you pick up your airplane for that first flight after maintenance. You, you always want to pick up your airplane from the shop during normal business hours, never at night or, or a weekend when the shop is closed, because if you have a problem, you want them to be able to correct it. Pick it up in the morning or early afternoon. Don't do it close to quitting time, again, for the same reason. If you've got a problem, you want to take it back and have them fix the problem before you take the airplane home with you. Um, now, now, here's one <laughs> that, that most pilots don't think of, but all mechanics think of it. Don't pick up your airplane on a Friday if you can possibly avoid it. <clears throat> Maintenance shops are crazy on Fridays because everybody wants to pick up their airplane on a Friday because they all have plans for the weekend. So most maintenance shops on Friday are, are, are just um, a, an absolute explosion of trying to button up airplanes and get them out the door. And in, 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 a, in a situation like that, that's just a perfect setup for making these errors of omission that we were talking about. Um, because the mechanics are under a lot of time pressure at the end of the week. So if you possibly can pick up your airplane on a day other than a Friday, it's a really good idea. Uh, morning or early afternoon, Monday through Thursday is the best time to pick up your airplane. And just one more thing. Um, and this, is, this one is one that we see all the time. Don't ever pick up your airplane after maintenance without getting a signed logbook entry approving it for return to service. In the case of an annual inspection, it would be a logbook entry that certifies that the aircraft has been examined as and found in airworthy condition. It is extremely common, in my experience, for shops to deliver an aircraft to a client, frequently on a Friday, um, and take an IOU for the paperwork and say, well, you know, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll get the paperwork done on Monday. We didn't get it done in time for your Friday departure. And if you pick your airplane up in that condition, it's a real setup for, for a, a violation because the regs are a little bit strange in this regard. The, the regulations for mechanics and, and the, the, the regs that, that govern mechanics um, logbook entries are uh, 43.9 and 43.11. 43.9 is, 43.11 is for, for inspections and 43.9 is for everything else. And they require mechanics to prepare and sign logbook entries, but they don't provide any, any timeliness requirement for doing so. So if a mechanic um, doesn't, does a work on your airplane and doesn't make the logbook entry for three months, he isn't violating any regulation. There's nothing that says how, how soon a mechanic needs to make that logbook entry after he completes the work. It just requires him to make the logbook entry sometime. But the reg that, that applies to pilots, which is 91407, prohibits you flying the aircraft until the paperwork has been completed. So if you accept an aircraft from a shop and you don't get the signed logbook entry along with the aircraft and you fly the aircraft, you're, you're in violation of 91407. Now, most of the time you'll get away with it. But, but if something happens, let's say you land gear up because you know, the, something during the maintenance caused the gear not to extend properly. Um, you know, the first thing they're gonna wanna look at when they investigate your accident is, is, is your maintenance records. And they're gonna find that you were flying the airplane and, there, and it hadn't been approved for return to service. And the mechanic's not gonna be in trouble. You're gonna be in trouble as the pilot in command. So, Never ever accept an IOU for a logbook entry. The plane doesn't do you any good without the signed paperwork that goes with it, approving the aircraft for return to service. And, and one more thing, I don't know if any of you fly experimental aircraft, but for experimental amateur built aircraft, there is a, a catch 22 in the regulations that you should be aware of. And we've run into this problem a couple of times um, part 43 
doesn't apply to experimental aircraft. So the regulation that requires mechanics to make logbook entries doesn't apply to experimental aircraft. But 91407 applies to all aircraft, experimental or certificated. So although the mechanic is not required by regulation to give you a logbook entry, you aren't allowed to fly your airplane without one. So if you have an EAB and you take it to a, to a mechanic as opposed to say working on it yourself under, a, uh, under your limited repairman certificate, you wanna make sure that you have an agreement with the mechanic that he is gonna give you a logbook entry for the work he does on your experimental aircraft, even though he's not required to, because otherwise you can't legally fly the airplane. So at any rate, um, that's all the prepared material that I have, and uh, I would be glad to open things up for, for Q&A. Hey, I'll, I'll leave my contact information on here so anybody who wants to email me or something it can has my contact information. Hey, Mike, there was, uh, there was a question here, um, which was, uh, why do the EGT goes up when you're only on one mag? Oh, it's a good question. Why does EGT go up when you're on one mag? Um, the reason is, let me, let me turn my uh, camera on here so you can see it's really me answering the question. Yeah. Um, the reason EGT goes up when you're on one mag is because um, the combustion event in the cylinder progresses more slowly when only one spark plug is firing. Under normal circumstances, there are two ignition points in the cylinder at, at the two different spark plugs, and the, fr the flame fronts that are, that are generated by each spark plug burn sort of towards one another and meet in the middle of the, of the combustion chamber. But when you're running on one mag, there's only one ignition point, and that flame front has to burn all the way across the, the whole combustion chamber, and that takes longer. And because it takes longer, um, when the exhaust valve opens, um, the combustion event hasn't had as much time to cool off. Um, and so you see that in uh, with, in, uh, with elevated DGT because the, the exhaust gas that is going out the exhaust port when the exhaust valve opens is hotter because it's, it, it, it was burning slower and it, it, and it, and it hasn't had an, as much time to cool off by the time the exhaust valve opens. So one of the other questions that came up, Mike, was um, as far as um, whenever it, like an annual is done here as an example, um, is it advisable to go through it with your AMP or just do it as like a pre-flight like you would normally do after the, the AMP gives you a signed logbook? Um, what, what would you recommend on that one? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Did, when, when, you, when you were asking about whether you should go over it with your ANP, do you mean during the inspection, like an owner-assisted annual, or are you talking about strictly the after but, the airplane's been signed off? Yeah, I, I think the, the the question was coming from like an owner, uh, it, it, the, kind of help out the AMP throughout the whole thing, just to make sure that nothing is missed, or does that kind of irritate AMPs to do that? Well, it varies. It varies with the shop. Um, I am a huge fan of owner-assisted annuals. Um, that's how I got into maintenance myself. I, you know, I've, I've been a pilot for 55 years. I've only been a mechanic for about 25 years. And I, I, I got into the maintenance side of things uh, doing an owner-assisted annual and discovering that I was really interested in it and, and gradually did more and more. And, and I feel that every aircraft owner owes it to himself to do at least one full owner assisted annual um, because you learn such an immense amount about the whole maintenance process, about how mechanics think, about how the world looks from the other side of the toolbox. It's, it's just a wonderful education. And you know, some of you um, might get bitten by the bug like I did and decide that you really enjoy working on the airplane and, and get more involved in it. Some of you might not, um, but but at least at least doing it once is a terrific educational uh, opportunity that I strongly recommend to to every aircraft owner. Excellent. Okay. Awesome. All right, uh, I'll take the next one. Okay, go ahead, John. You, you, you got. Okay, I don't want to step on you either. So, 
And uh, I've got a question. It says uh, from Jason Giles, uh, Mike, uh, did you say perform the run up with a lean mixture as opposed to a rich mixture? I, I prefer to do run ups with a with a lean mixture. Um, I, again, I recommend on for all ground operations once the once the engine is warmed up a little bit um, that you should lean the engine to at least as lean as best power mixture, which you can tell by, because it's, it's where you get maximum RPM. As you start to lean the, if you're idling the engine, you start to lean the mixture, you'll see that the RPM rises a little bit, usually around 50 RPM or so if the idle mixture is adjusted correctly. And then if you keep leaning it, eventually it will start to go back, the RPM will go to back down a little bit, and then the engine will start getting rough and starting to stumble. And the, the, the maximum RPM point is best power mixture. And I recommend leaning the engine during ground operations to at least that lean. Um, I tend to lean it even a little leaner than best power mixture uh, to pretty much the leanest I can get where the engine won't stumble when I throttle up to, to taxi. Um, but a lean mixture keeps the engine a whole lot cleaner and then, as I said, when we're doing a run-up and testing, doing the mag check, um, a lean mixture, it makes it harder for the spark plugs to ignite the mixture. So it will show up um, marginal ignition performance, like, like a you know, spark plug that, that's gapped wrong or, or uh, you know, a, a, a shaky ignition lead or something like that. Those things will be more likely to show up during the mag check if, if you do the mag check lean. Most of the POHs uh, talk about doing it full rich, but that's really not the best practice in my view, and that's not the way I teach. Gotcha. Um, is there anything specific on an avionics upgrade that you would uh, that you'd be looking at? Like as an example, putting in uh, G5s or GI275s or engine monitors? <laughs> It's, 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 it's near and dear to your heart right now, right? Funny, funny you should say that because tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow is the test flight. The airplane, my airplane has been in the avionics shop for uh, about 10 days. I'm, and I've been locked in this hotel room for about 10 days waiting for the uh, avionics upgrade. We, we, we powered up everything today. Uh, nothing smoked. That was always a good sign. We, tested a bunch of stuff on the ground, discovered that a, a few things were, were wrong. We discovered, for example, that the, that the glide slope input to the autopilot was connected backwards so that it would fly up when it was supposed to fly down. And we corrected that, corrected a couple of other things. And then tomorrow morning, I'm going out to the airport with, with the, the head of the avionic shop and we're gonna go fly the airplane. Um, and we're going to, uh, um, Obviously, I'm, I'm going to have to learn quite a bit of buttonology because I've never flown behind the GI-275 before. I've now read the pilot's manual twice and the installation manual once, so I've done as much as I can in terms of the head work, but you, you really have to get this stuff in, into your muscle memory, so I'm going to spend a little time doing that, and then um, if everything goes well, then Thursday I get to fly home to California. It's a four-hour flight, so I'll have four hours to, to play around with the avionics on the way home, and I will probably use the full width of the airway while I'm doing it. <laughs> right. um, but uh, uh, we're going to we're, we're going to uh, uh, do every kind of approach that uh, that that I can think of that uh, coupled to the autopilot. We're going to do a, a GPS LPV approach. We're going to do an ILS. We're going to do a back course. Um, I discovered today that they had left out the back course switch so my autopilot wouldn't have been able to follow a back course and my home airport the the approach that we shoot about 90 percent of the time is a localizer DME back course approach so it's very important to me that the autopilot can fly a back course so we're going to be doing all of all of that sort of stuff tomorrow running uh, I'm, I'm particularly concerned about the autopilot interface because the you know, the instrument is very smart and it's going to do what it's supposed to do. I'm just going to have to learn how to make it do that. But it's the interface with other things that really is where the challenge is. So uh, I'm going to be focusing um, a, a lot of attention to making sure that the autopilot is, is working with this, with all this new equipment that's driving it. Awesome. Uh, so 
any differences in pre-flighting for a rental aircraft versus someone who owns their own aircraft? Well, I think in general, you, you need to pre-flight more carefully in a rental aircraft simply because um, in an airplane you own, you're usually the last guy that flew it. So you kind of left it in, in, a, in a state that you expect. And when you get back in the airplane, the next time you fly it, it you don't really expect a lot of surprises. Um, but in a rental airplane, it, you typically you're not the last one to fly it. And so you can't assume that where the fuel selector was left. You can't af- assume uh, how the switches are set. You can't assume that all the breakers are, are pushed in and stuff like that. So I think in a rental aircraft, you, you, you de- do need to pre-flight it more thoroughly simply because other people are flying it and you don't really know how they left it. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, once, uh, once you're done, uh, so the paperwork, once it's provided by the mechanic, would you advise taking photos of the paperwork and emailing them to somebody uh, as a precaution in case something happens during the flight? Uh, obviously, you're going to have the paper log books on board, right? So if something happens, would that be advisable or? Well, let's, let's just, you, you bring up a very good question. I'm about to get up on my soapbox and give you a small <laughs> lecture on this subject because you just brought up a subject that's near and dear to my heart. Um, first of all, air, uh, aircraft maintenance records should never, ever, ever be carried in the aircraft. Second of all, aircraft maintenance records, in my view, should never leave the owner's Um, custody and control. There is no reason that anyone else in the world needs to have access to the original copies of your logbooks. And we instruct our managed maintenance customers to lock their logbooks up in in a nice fireproof safe and never let them out of their custody and control. Um, we We have their logbooks scanned into a PDF file and we put them put that PDF file in the cloud. So anyone who, any shop or whatever, who needs access to the maintenance record to do uh, AD research or, or whatever, um, has access to the electronic version, not the paper version. We have all maintenance records, uh, we, we have all, anybody who works on the airplane uh, make maintenance records on a self-adhesive stickers. Um, we scan those stickers we review the stickers and you'd be surprised how often we send a logbook entry back to a mechanic and say, that's no good, do it over again. Um, if they're writing directly in your logbook, you can't do that. And so we never let anybody write directly in a logbook. We always have them make the maintenance entries on stickers. We review them. If we like them, we scan them, add them to the electronic records and then have the owner paste them into the in, into the original records. Um, but, but a lot of owners leave their logs down at the shop. That's a very, very bad uh, habit in my view for a couple reasons. One is if the maintenance records are left at the shop, the owner has no way of verifying that the aircraft has been signed off for, with an approval for return to service. Um, and, and so he's just, you know, he's just hoping <laughs> that the airplane's legal to fly. Second of all, I've seen a lot of cases where shops will hold maintenance, hold logbooks hostage over, say, a, a dispute over an invoice or something like that. Um, if you never give the shop access to, to, to those original maintenance records, then they can't possibly hold them hostage. Um, we don't ever want the, the maintenance records in the airplane. Because if something happens to the airplane, we, we don't want the maintenance records to burn up with the, with the wreckage. And, and oh, by the way, if, if you fly somewhere and land, I, I hope this is okay to say on a fast team thing, and, and you get ramp checked, you don't want the maintenance records there. You want us to, to, to make an agreement with the inspector that you will bring the logbooks to him at, an, at a mutually convenient time after you've had a chance to make sure that you know, all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed and all of the, the, the latest stickers have been s- stuck in the right place in the, in, in, in the log books and so on. So, um, in fact, we, we, we never even give FA inspectors access to the original logs because they get everything that they need from an electronic copy. 
Um, and we've never had an FAA inspector complain about that. We've had accidents, all sorts of things, and the electronic copies are all, all they need to see. They don't need to see the original. So we, we don't like to let owners make their original maintenance records available to anyone. And the only exception to that rule is there is a time when you're required to make the maintenance records uh, accessible to somebody else, and that's when you sell the airplane. <laughs> you're required to transfer those records to the new owner. Um, but other than that, uh, we, we don't, we, we recommend that owners keep them locked up in a nice fireproof safe somewhere and, and never let anybody have access to the originals. Off, uh, my, my flame is off and I'm off my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Mike, I'll give you another soapbox because I know this is another popular <laughs> discussion topic of yours. Uh, what is your opinion of lean of peak operations? Um, I was uh, an early adopter of lean of peak operations. Um, I think they're, I, I'm, I'm not um, dogmatic about it. Uh, I, you know, I don't try to go around persuading other people to operate that way, but I've been operating my engines lean of peak for 20 years. Um, I don't know of anybody who has achieved the sort of engine longevity that, that I have achieved with, with the engines on my Cessna 310 operated almost exclusively lean of peak. Um, the engines on my Cessna 310 happen to be Continental TSIO 520 BB engines that have a, a, a very scotch uh, published TBO of 1400 hours. Um, I finally overhauled one of my engines at 3300 hours and the other engine I haven't overhauled at all. So, um, I'm obviously the, the op, engines obviously like lean to peak a lot. <laughs> uh, that's all I can say. But uh, there, there's just a lot of advantages to lean to peak operation, and and you know I'm always amused by mechanics who 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 blame burn valves and things on lean to peak operation um, because lean to peak does not is, is about the kindest thing you can do to to an engine. And that mechanic who is telling the, the owner that, that he shouldn't operate Lena Peak because it's going to burn up his engine, then jumps into his Toyota pickup truck and drives home. And of course, his Toyota pickup truck's running Lena Peak all the time because it couldn't pass smog checks if it didn't, you know. But at uh, any rate, I'm a big believer in Lena Peak. Gotcha. That wasn't a soapbox. That was like a half a soapbox. I was going to say that was a <laughs> mini soapbox. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so another question, uh, somebody had a suggestion to them to do an aborted takeoff or a full power run up when fresh out of annual and then shutting it down and inspect for leaks, uh, check, you know, for, for anything that's loose, so on and so forth. Would you recommend that or just, uh, what would you do there? Um, I don't like full power run ups because, uh, it's very abusive to an engine. Um, you're, you're asking the engine to produce a lot of power, but you're not giving it any cooling air. Um, because the thing is sitting there with the brakes being held. So what, uh, what I always recommend when you, you need to test something at, at full power uh, is, is a high-speed taxi. And uh, hopefully you're at an airport with a, a, a reasonably long runway. And, and you, can, uh, you can basically do a, a, a takeoff, achieve full power, and then pull the power off midway down the runway and and uh, and uh, and come to a come to a stop, and and when when we when we have a a, a significant issue, I mean, for example, um, uh, first uh, flight of an experimental aircraft after the engine's gone in and stuff, uh, we we always recommend doing. Um, doing high speed, uh, high speed takeoffs or high speed taxis rather, uh, with a, with an abort. Um, now that's fairly it's controversial. Some people don't believe in that, but but my own feeling is I would much rather see um, what I call a high speed ta full power high speed taxi uh, down the runway than than to do a, a full power run up with the with the airplane not moving because uh, at least you're getting some cooling air over the engine when when you do it down the runway. So I've got a question. Uh, do you do any videos um, for owners who are not mechanically inclined? Um, well, I do a lot of webinars. They're, they're, they're not live videos, but um, I, do, uh, um, 
I do a, uh, a maintenance oriented webinar every month on the first Wednesday of the month. Um, it's uh, it's uh, presented by uh, EAA and it's, uh, it's sponsored by Aircraft Spruce. I have over a hundred of them now uh, and they're all on the Savvy Aviation YouTube channel uh, and they cover just about every subject you can imagine. It's a, it's a great wealth of stuff. The videos are typically, oh, they're, they're usually about three quarters of an hour of, of prepared material and three quarters of an hour of Q&A on a different subject every month. Um, I invite people to, uh, uh, to participate in them live. We, we typically get about a thousand people showing up for, for each one of them. And then many, many thousands of people watch the, the, the videos afterwards. But uh, the, the, if you want to do it live, um, uh, go to the uh, EAA, eaa.org slant webinar. Uh, and you'll be able to register for the webinar and participate live. You also get both wings and AMT credit uh, for, for doing those live. And if you're interested in just viewing some of the more than 100 um, webinars that I've done in the past, you, you can go to the Savvy Aviation um, uh, YouTube channel and they're all there. Okay. Another question for all the 182 owners out there. How can a carbureted engine get to Lena Peak smooth operations? Um, 182 is, uh, the, the 182, the, the, uh, uh, the down and welded 182s, uh, that, that are powered by the Continental 0470 engines, uh, are particularly, um, challenging to operate Lena Peak because they have probably the worst mixture distribution of, of, of any certificated engine I know of. Uh, the, the, just the, the, they have a very, very asymmetrical induction system. And so the, the rear cylinders always run lean and the front cylinders always run rich. And that's just the nature of those engines. And it makes it harder to run them lean a peak. Carbureted light combings tend to be much, much more even because the carburetor is located pretty much dead center in the middle of the engine uh, and, and the induction system is much more symmetrical. Um, but it is possible, and I've got about 4,000 hours in, 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 in uh, 0470 powered Skylanes. That was my, my very first airplane was a, was a Skylane, and I've flown them a lot. They're wonderful airplanes. And you can actually run those engines lean a peak, at least a little bit lean a peak. And there are two tricks that are very helpful in, in, in accomplishing that. Um, one is to, uh, is to always cruise at something slightly less than full throttle. If you pull the throttle back just a little, just maybe a, a, a half a needle width on the manifold pressure gauge, it cocks the, um, the, the throttle butterfly uh, in the carburetor um, enough to cause turbulence in the airflow as it's going through the carburetor and it improves the, the atomization of the fuel. Uh, the, 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 the fuel air mixture, you think of it as, as tiny little droplets of fuel being suspended in air. And as it goes through the induction system of the, of, of the 0470 engine, it turns a lot of corners. And the, the, the air turns the corners without any problem, but the fuel kind of wants to go straight. <laughs> so the smaller the droplet, the smaller the droplet size, the, the easier it is for the fuel to turn the corners. And that's really what causes the mixture imbalance. So uh, cocking the throttle plate just a little bit from, uh, by pulling the throttle back a little bit from pull throttle helps. And the other thing that helps quite a bit, especially in the winter, is to use a, a little bit of partial carb heat, which again improves the, uh, the, the atomization of the fuel, in, um, the, the, the fuel air mixture that comes out of the carburetor and helps to turn those corners. And by using those two tricks, you can run a, a, a Cessna 182 um, at least a little bit lean a peak before it starts running rough. It is the hardest engine I know of to run Lena Peak. And carbureted light combings, like in a 172, for example, they tend to be much easier to run Lena Peak. There, there's some mythology out there that says you can't run carbureted engines Lena Peak. It's just not right. It's just not correct. I've got a question in the chat box that says, uh, would you mind explaining while uh, turbo and turbo normalized aircraft have some much longer takeoff rolls. For example, the supplemental material for the TAT A36 I fly 
says to use the A36 charts and add 30%. Um, well, the, the reason a, a, a turbocharged or turbo normalized engine, um, th th there are really two considerations. For the turbo normalized Bonanza, which is really a, a standard um, uh, I, you know, IO550 engine uh, with a turbo normalizer in front of it. Um, the reason it performs a little bit less well on takeoff is because it's breathing hot air coming out of the turbocharger. And so even though it may be a cool day outside, the engine is breathing hot air because it's the, the air is being compressed by the, by the turbocharger. And uh, obviously engines um, run, um, produce less power with hot air. Um, the, the other consideration is that if it's a turbocharged engine, um, like uh, on my turbo 310, for example, the compression ratio of the engine is, is, uh, is less. The, 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 engine, the turbocharged engines use different pistons. So for example, uh, a TSIO 520 that's in my 310 has a seven and a half to one compression ratio. But an IO520, which is what would be in the normally aspirated 310, has an eight and a half to one compression ratio. And the higher com the compression ratio, the, the more energy the engine can extract from the fuel and the less energy gets wasted going out the exhaust pipe. Uh, that's why the, the higher compression ratio engines um, have lower um, uh, exhaust gas temperatures because the they extract more energy from the, the from, from the fuel air mixture and waste less energy going out the back door. And that's what EGT is measuring is, is basically it's measuring the, the energy that is being wasted that the engine can't convert to useful um, horsepower and, and it's just throwing out the back door at the end of the combustion events. So those are really the two things that, that affect, that, that cause the turbocharged engines to um, have a re, have, have a, an increased takeoff roll down low. Now, if it, what, I'm in Alamosa, Colorado right now, the airport is at 7,500 feet. Uh, I, I guarantee you that that your turbocharged Bonanza would would take off a whole lot quicker up here than a normally aspirated Bonanza. But down at sea level, um, the normally aspirated Bonanza has a little bit of advantage. Gotcha. Uh, next question, is there a reporting process uh, for APs or IAs that perform maintenance in a reckless or deficient manner? And if there is, is it uh, effective in preventing it from happening again? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it, is, it is, in my experience, pretty uncommon for uh, a mechanic or IA to be violated by the FAA. It's much less common than it is for pilots to be violated. Um, and there are a lot of problems involved in violating a mechanic uh, because for the FAA to pursue a violation against a mechanic, they have to be able to prove that the mechanic did something wrong. And it turns out that that proving it is often quite tricky. Um, I had the occasion of, of, of where I was dealing with a client who, who got an airplane out of, out of an annual inspection and it was an absolute death trap and it got signed off by, by an IA as being airworthy and it was like probably the, the least airworthy airplane we've ever seen. And we did try to see if we could pursue a violation against the IA who signed it off. And it turned out to be very, very difficult. And uh, I, I talked to a number of air within safety inspectors about this, and it's not the easiest thing in the world to pursue a violation against a mechanic. So it, it does happen once in a while. The, the easiest sort of violation to, um, uh, to pursue against a mechanic is if you can prove that, that, that he did what, uh, Bill O'Brien and the FAA used to call autographing a lie, where he made a logbook entry, said he did something, say he complied with an, with, with an AD, and then it turned out he didn't do it. And if you can prove that, that, that he lied uh, in, a, in a logbook entry and made a fraudulent logbook entry, then the FAA can pretty much throw the book at him. But it doesn't happen very often in my experience. Okay. 
Okay, and then I've got a question here. Um, well, it says, are there any issues with CHTs running on the low side, uh, less than 315 uh, most of the time and maxing out around 345 in climb in an IO 360 uh, for a, a PA28R200, an arrow? Um, the answer is yes. There, 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 obviously, we, we, I think we all know that there are issues with the CHTs running too hot. And I don't like to see CHTs get above about 400 degrees Fahrenheit uh, for continental engines or above about 420 for Lycoming engines. Light Lycomings tend to run about 20 degrees hotter CHT for, for good reasons, most of which have to do with their sodium filled exhaust valves, which transfer heat to the cylinder head more efficiently than, than the continental um, uh, solid stem valves. But uh, the, the problem with CHTs that are too low is that if the combustion temperature is not high enough, uh, you wind up having problems um, scavenging the lead out of avgas. Now, this is not a problem for engines that run on unleaded uh, MOGAS, for example. So if, if, if you have a, an engine that is running on MOGAS with, a, with an STC, or if you're running a Rotax or something that was designed to operate on unleaded fuel, you don't have to worry about this. But if you're running uh, an engine on 100 low lead, which by the way, is not very low lead, it's very high lead actually. Um, uh, and the lead is in there to, to allow the, the fuel to get up to 100 octane. It's, it's, a, it's an octane enhancer. And that's the good part of, of tetraethyl lead. But in every other respect, tet tetraethyl lead is really terrible stuff. And the, the problem is that, that tetraethyl lead uh, turns into lead oxide. That's what actually gives the octane enhancing. Lead oxide is um, conductive. So it forms deposits on spark plugs and shorts them out. And uh, that's, that's not a good thing. So uh, our, the 100 lead, low lead avgas is blended with a lead scavenging agent called ethylene dibromide. And the ethylene dibromide combines with the lead oxide and turns it into, into, uh, into lead bromide, which is a gas which goes out the exhaust. And, and that's what keeps our spark plugs from fouling. It's a fairly complicated chemical reaction that goes through a number of intermediate stages that are called lead oxybromide and, and then eventually becomes lead bromide and goes out the exhaust. Um, and it's those intermediate products, the lead oxybromides that cause uh, deposits that do all sorts of, mi of, of, mi of uh, mischief in the engines and in particular in Lycomings there, it's those deposits that are responsible for, for valve sticking. We, we talked about morning sickness a little earlier. That's the valve sticking problem. It tends to happen more in Lycomings than in Continentals because they use sodium filled exhaust valves. So the bottom line is if, if, if combustion temperatures are too cool and the best indication we have of that is cylinder head temperature because we don't really have a, a gauge that measures combustion temperature directly so the best proxy we have is cylinder head temperature. If it's too cool, we have problems with lead scavenging. Um, and the way you can tell if you have a problem is to do a bore scope inspection of the cylinder on a regular basis and, and rotate the prop so that the exhaust valve is all the way open. And then when you stick the bore scope in the spark plug hole and look around, you can see the lower valve stem and see how much, uh, w whether it's getting a lot of crusty deposits built up on it. If it is getting crusty deposits built up on it, and the other thing you can look at is, is, the, um, is the ceramic nose core insulator of your spark plugs. If they're getting a lot of metallic lead deposits, uh, those are both indications that you have a lead scavenging problem and it would be better if you ran hotter uh, cylinder head temperatures. Um, I, I wouldn't change my operation without actually looking to see if you have a problem. If you don't have a problem, then you don't have to worry about it. But it's easy enough to see whether you have a lead scavenging problem by, first of all, looking at your spark plugs and seeing if there's lead buildup on them. And second of all, doing a bore scope inspection with the exhaust valve open and seeing whether the lower stem of the exhaust valve has a lot of deposits getting built up on it. And if either of those are the case, then you probably want to alter your 
operation a little bit to increase the combustion temperatures and, and bring the cylinder head temperatures up. Gotcha. Uh, next question is from Chris. Um, what do you think about proactive preventive maintenance on things like mags? Uh, mine are at 500 hours and running fine, but I wonder if I'm setting myself up for failure on a long trip soon. Yeah, you know, I, I'm a big believer in general about doing things on condition rather than on a fixed timetable, but magnetos are one of the few exceptions to that rule. Um, and the reason is that, first of all, magnetos have, have a lot of stuff in them that can fail. They, they've got a lot of plastic and nylon components. They, they, they've, they've got uh, consumable components like carbon brushes that wear out. Um, and they're, you know, unlike, for example, an, uh, an engine where we have all kinds of good ways of determining condition. We can stick borescopes in the cylinders. We can look at, cut open the oil filter. We can send oil samples out to the lab. We can do all sorts of things to determine the condition of an engine without tearing the engine apart. But with mags, we really don't have a good way to do that. There's, there's, we can't drain the oil of a mag. We can't, there's no filter. There's no place to stick a borescope in. The only way we can tell the condition of a magneto is, is to take it apart. And so it's one of those rare things on an airplane that I do believe that every 500 hours, the mag really needs to go through a teardown inspection. Um, it does not need to go through an overhaul. It only needs to go through a 500 hour IRAN and the service manuals for both Slick and Bendix mags give, give the procedure for a 500 hour IRAN and it's considerably less than what an overhaul would be. Um, of course, the other solution to that is, is to get rid of those old tractor mags and consider putting in uh, an electronic ignition. And we've now got a, a couple of them that are, are, are approved for, for certified airplanes, the, the Electro Air and the Surefly. And uh, my, it's my understanding that the FAA is just on the verge of, a, of, of approving the Electro Air for dual installation. Up till now, you could only replace one mag with an electronic mag and you needed to, a tractor mag as the second one. But, um, but I'm hearing that the FAA is very close to approving uh, dual uh, Electro Air installations, I think initially on four cylinder light combings, where you'll be able to get rid of the mechanical mags altogether. And the, of course the electronic mags don't need to be taken apart every 500 hours. They hardly have any moving parts, they're all electronic. So it's a much better mousetrap. Um, and that's, that's really the, but as long as you have conventional mags, and I've got four of them in my airplane, uh, I do recommend uh, having a disassembly inspection or, or a 500 hour disassembly inspection um, every 500 hours. I've got uh, one question about leaning for dis high density altitude and uh, uh, this is kind of a question from my perspective. I'm a helicopter pilot. I fly piston-powered uh, helicopters, R-22s and R-44s. Um, do you have any experience with uh, the Robison products at all? Unfortunately, I don't. I'm, I'm, I'm strictly an airplane guy. So there, I, I do have a couple of guys on my staff that have uh, Robinson experience, but I personally don't. I'm, I apologize. The the question that's okay the question is, is because our poh is i'm sorry our approved flight manuals uh state that uh because a robinson helicopter does not have a prop to continue to turn the crankshaft um from airflow uh, if you inadvertently lean excessively you can actually cause the engine to fail and then you set yourself up for a situation where you need to auto rotate and whatnot uh, but where i was going with that is uh, the POH says not to lean, um, but we all know that if you're operating at sea level, that's one thing, but how about operating at, say, uh, Leadville, Colorado? Well, I mean, obviously, uh, you're going to have to lean the engine to operate at Leadville, Colorado, unless the engine is equipped with an altitude compensating fuel pump, which I expect that it probably isn't. Um, and you'll have to forgive my ignorance, but uh, do, do you have um, a, a tachometer on the engine as opposed to, as to uh, not rotor RPM, but actually engine RPM? Can you, can you measure that? 
We can. We have uh, engine RPM and rotor RPM. So on uh, the. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what what I think I would do, and again, I'm speaking from ignorance about helicopters, but 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 I'm not ignorant about piston aircraft engine. Sure. It, it would be to um, uh, to lean the engine. Uh, if you're taking off from Leadville, Colorado, I would lean the engine um, to achieve maximum engine RPM, which puts you at about best power mixture, um, and and then you can. Uh, then you can go ahead and uh, you know s spin up the rotor and and, and take off. Uh, but ob obviously, if you if you operate an engine full rich out of Leadville, uh, I mean I I don't know if you can hover in ground effect at Leadville, but uh, but if you exactly, uh, <laughs> but, exactly. but but in just in general, you you know when 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 we run the engine with a full rich mixture. It's it's a hugely hugely rich mixture, and the reason it's hugely rich is is, is two two things. First of all, you need a very extraordinarily rich mixture to start an engine when it's cold. And if 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 you guys remember the, uh, if you're as old as I am, you remember that cars used to have a knob on the on on the instrument panel called a choke that you had to pull out to start the engine and then you push it in after the engine right. warmed up a little bit <laughs> and lawnmowers still have those you know so it's they're yeah. not um, but if, if if you if you don't provide that extra extraordinarily rich mixture by pulling the choke you'll never get the engine started but if you forget to turn off the choke and you just run it at that very rich mixture the engine's gonna be very unhappy and it's gonna, gonna get all sorts of black stuff out of the exhaust and so on well, an aircraft engine doesn't have a choke. What it does is it, it, it has a mixture control and the mixture control is set up so that the engine runs super rich when the knob is all the way in. Uh, and you need that for starting. Um, but once the engine starts to warm up, you need to come back on the knob to get to a more normal mixture. And the other time that the, that the knob should be full forward and basically the only two times, one is when you're starting the engine cold and the other is when you're making a, a takeoff from a low density altitude airport. And there, the reason that you need a, a very rich mixture is that you're operating the engine at very close to 100% power. And you need a little extra detonation margin, which is provided by an, an extra rich mixture, richer than best power mixture. Um, when you're taking off from a high density altitude airport, um, you don't have to worry about detonation margin because the engine isn't anywhere close to 100% power, assuming it's, it's normally aspirated. If it's turbocharged, you always take off full rich. But if it's a normally aspirated engine, you only take off full rich at low density altitudes where you're worried about um, uh, detonation. If you're taking off from a high density altitude airport where full, full power is only you know 60% or 65% or whatever, then we're not worried about getting extra detonation margin. We're worried about getting all the power we possibly can out of that poor engine up at that altitude. And the way we achieve that is to lean to best power mixture, which is the mixture that gives you maximum RPM. Okay. So uh, that's what I thought because, uh, and, and I wanted to add to that. And like I said, the POH doesn't say anything about, uh, doing exactly what uh, you just discussed. And I had this conversation with another instructor the other day and uh, the manuals doesn't say anything about uh, leaning for higher density altitudes. Granted, Leadville is an extreme right. and the Rockus and helicopters actually have a guard on the mixture so that you don't inadvertently reach down and pull the mixture to uh, idle cutoff in place of the, the carburetor heat and flight uh -huh. and, and yeah. shut now so it's just something i wanted to, to talk to, to get your point of view on and i agree 100 percent with you paul now, and by the way just one more comment about that I, I was talking about leaning to to maximum rpm if if you're in an airplane right. and you have a controllable pitch prop or a constant speed prop on that airplane then if you want to lean to best power mixture you you you, you have to do it with a a power setting low enough that the prop isn't governing. So you can do it, you can lean to, to maximum RPM, uh, say during the run up where, where you're, you're running at, you know, 1700 RPM or something like that. 
but um, but you can't lean to best power mixture when you're when you're at RPM redline because the prop is going to be trying to keep the RPM constant by changing the pitch of the propeller. So you you, you have to uh, you have to find it, figure out where best power mixture is at a, at a at a a lower power setting, say in the run-up area, uh, where the prop is not yet, uh, where the prop is basically up against its high-speed stop, and it's not trying to change RPM out from under you. Excellent. All right, we got time for one more question, Paul. If you want to ask that question, uh, sure. The uh, high-density altitude. Uh, so, Mike, uh, high-density altitude begins at what altitude, based on your experience? MSL, AGL. Well, that that has that has changed. the The latest guidance from Lycoming, uh, which is guidance that they came out with, I forget the year, but they 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 revised their guidance to to say that they wanted you to lean any time you're above three thousand feet. It used to be uh, five thousand feet. Um, you know, I, I I recommend you know basically leaning all the time with the two exceptions that I mentioned. One is uh, when you're starting the engine cold, you need, you need a full rich mixture to start the engine cold. And the second is when you're taking off from a low density altitude airport, um, let's say, say 3000 feet density altitude or, or, or below. Um, but any other time uh, the mixture should be leaned in my view. Okay. All right, Jeremy, we need to keep it honest here. We need to wrap it up. <laughs> All right, Mike, I'll uh, go ahead and let you give your closing comments real quick if you have any. Uh, I just have a couple. Um, let me give me just a second here and figure out. I lost all my... I lost all my controls here. Wait a minute. Well, the controls should be down on the bottom. Oh, here they are. Here they are. I found them. Okay. I found them. <laughs> They're they're up here. Um, oh, am I still am I I'm still sharing my screen? You are, yes, sir. Yeah, I, for, I forgot that I was sharing my screen. Okay, then I don't need any controls. Uh, <laughs> never mind. Sorry. No, no, you're good. Um, I, I just wanted to invite everybody. I, I mentioned that I do these free monthly webinars. Uh, uh, EAA produces them on their on their go to webinar platform. Uh, Spruce. Uh, sponsors them. They're the first Wednesday of every month. Um, and you can go to uh, eaa.org slant webinars, or if you're an EAA member, you probably get their email newsletter and it billboards the, the, the webinars, but I do one every, every month. And then there's over a hundred of them that, that have been uh, videoed and that are all available on the Savvy Aviation YouTube channel. I have a monthly newsletter that I send out that you can sign up for at the SavvyAviation.com uh, website and it's it's all about maintenance related things. Um, I've got the four books. Uh, they're uh, available uh, at Amazon, and uh, they're also available at the EAA bookstore. And by the way, if any of you have my books, uh, I would really appreciate it if you would uh, if you would post um, reviews to Amazon um, and say how you like them. And that's really um, all I have. Um, I, I hope this is what you guys were, were hoping for. <laughs> Spot on. Absolutely is, excellent. We really appreciate your time, Mike. Really do. And your insight. I really appreciate it. And I can speak for everybody in the chat and everybody here in Central Texas and the regulars that uh, participate in this program. We really do appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much, Mike. Oh, you bet. Uh, you I'm bet. Sure. And, uh, couple of closing comments. I just wanted to say thank you all for participating tonight. Um, go ahead and help uh, support Mike, just as he uh, mentioned, uh, by writing a review about his books. And uh, check out the uh, Savvy YouTube channel. And then also, uh, if you could go check out All American Aviation. And uh, this webinar will be uploaded to the All American Aviation channel. And uh, for those of you wondering about getting wings credit, go ahead and send me an email at that email address that you see there on your screen. It says flyallamerican at gmail.com. Uh, send me an email with the code 
2162 tonight. And that's the way I'll be able to validate that you all uh, participated. And then uh, if you would, go ahead and join us on August the 25th, um, two weeks from tonight, as uh, guest speaker Dayton Dabbs from Lone Star Gyros is, go is gonna join us. He's gonna present a presentation on high density altitude operations and he'll discuss uh, some of the things that he got to do in the gyro plane with setting some records and flying in LaGuardia and to Cuba and a high density altitude event in uh, Colorado. So everybody, I just wanted to say again, thank you for your time and thank you Paul for helping me out for another great webinar. And Mike, I look forward to uh, 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 participating in your future webinars and uh, we'll be in touch, sir. Great. I, I enjoyed it. Um, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Thanks again, Mike. Have a good evening. All right. All right. Have a good evening, everyone. We'll Night, talk everybody. to you in two weeks from tonight.